back to order. We're here today at the Standing Committee of Climate Change and Environmental Stewardship. We're very proud to have the uh, University of New Brunswick's Professor Alan Curry, Professor of Biology, Forestry, and Environmental Management. Dr. Curry, we're um, enthusiastic to have you here today. You'll have a 20-minute presentation. When you have five minutes left, I'll put my hand up like this. If you don't see me, I may have to say it in the microphone, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but it's my only way of getting a hold of you. Um, once the 20 minutes is up, um, we're going to take 40, you'll, you'll have 40 minutes of questions, 10 minutes from each political party if they so choose to use it all, starting with the official opposition. Um, once again, excited to have you here. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. <clears throat> and thanks to the committee for the opportunity to come today and speak, speak to you, doing some important work here. So hopefully we can give you some insights from what the, the few things that we know. When I asked what the committee would like to hear about today, uh, the word of water came up and they wanted to hear about water. So what I've done today is I've structured a talk about water in the New Brunswick landscape, give you an idea of how it works my machine going here. So I'm just going to go through a few things today. I'm going to talk about water basically on the landscape, how we think about water, how, what the processes are around water, how it's working, and then I want to talk a bit about why it matters to New Brunswickers because we do manage our land for lots of different resource uses. So I'll try to touch a little bit on that as well and then give you an opportunity to ask some questions. I'm going to give you the punchline already to, the, to my talk is that things that we think uh, we know about, some, some of the things like water that we think we've studied enough and we understand it, it actually turns out that it's much more complicated than we are used to thinking about it and that means that we have to start thinking a little bit more about how we manage our landscapes, our resources, our water, our trees. So that's your punch line. Okay, so first off you hear this word a lot, landscape, you probably heard it in this in this group a lot. What does it mean by a landscape? A landscape just means all of that land that you can see from whatever high point you happen to be standing on. So it doesn't have a real defined definition other than it's what you see. So you could be standing on the top of Mount Carleton looking across our forested landscape of the north. You could also be in Drummond looking across the landscape in Drummond to see <clears throat> uh, this kind of a landscape as well. These are landscapes, it's what you see and that's how we in terms of water, how we think about this water, what's happening and when that water is out on that landscape. So this is what we typically think about when it comes to water, and we think about it in terms of what we can call topography or the hills, hills and valleys that you see out there. So on the left-hand side, you can see a basic diagram of a river network where you can see that around the outside of the network, there's ones and that goes twos, threes, four. That's going from the headwaters and springs that are way up in the, in the headwater regions down through the main river and collecting. And that's how what we think of in terms of water on the landscape. Then on the right-hand side, that's how the scientists look at it. We partition it by putting a line around that watershed or that catchment area. And we say that all the water that falls on that inside that circle on the right hand side, inside the yellow line, it collects into our rivers and lakes and wet, wetlands and flows down through to the outlet of the main river. So that's how we typically look at the landscape <clears throat> when we're managing the resources that we work on today. So if we were to look at the Miramichi River for <clears throat> for example, this is, this is a typical map that we would look at and say, okay, here's the Miramichi River all of that color area that you can see in there. And you, that, so all of that is the area where the water falls on the land and it's collected in the Miramichi. And then we divide it up into all of these other smaller catchments. And that's all the different colors that you see there. If you could see it up close, you'd see whatever your favorite river in the Miramichi is, it's there. So that's how we typically look at our landscape and the water on the landscape. A very two-dimensional picture of, of how the water works. And we think about it this way, because that's, that's what we like about water. We like lakes and rivers. And that's how we have developed most of our management plans for water. But this is what water really looks like. It's much more complicated in terms of the cycle that it's in. So this is the global water cycle. 
on the right hand side is the ocean, but it's in all the surface waters where water is evaporated, it goes up into the atmosphere, creates cl clouds, and then we have precipitation, rain and snow that comes back down to the earth. And I was gonna point at this, but I didn't wanna, I'm just gonna try not to hit the, the uh, chair up there with the laser pointer. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna take that chance, but <clears throat> basically the water on the right hand of that diagram is being collected up into the atmosphere. It's forming clouds and it's falling down onto the land. And that's all the surface water that we think of, the rivers, the lakes, the wetlands, running off the surface. But down in the bottom left, you can see the brown area. That's actually underground. <clears throat> and much of the water that we have that comes back to the surface actually infiltrates into the ground. And there's a lot of water that's actually under the ground that we never really think about. So it's under the ground in different ways. This is one very shallow groundwater, we call localized groundwater. It's the water that's on the falls on the hill slope and some of it's going to run off, but some of it's going to percolate into the soils and some of it's going to work its way down and become saturated and create something we call the water table. So there's water down there. And all of that water is always flowing downhill because water has mass, it's heavy. You know that your glass of water is heavy. It wants to go to the sea. It, like everything else, it's gravity. It's trying to pull it down to sea level. So water is always on the move. So this is on a local level. Then if you look deeper into the, into the earth for this water, on the top here, on the top of this figure, so over on the right is some precipitation and some hills down through the green area. That's all the surface and then down below is the cross section into the earth. And the first blue line you see up there is the timeline for years. So we had local water on the hill slope I showed you. We also have water that's traveling at, in time scales of years, some in centuries, some in millennia. But there's always water down there under the earth and it's moving through at different rates and for those of you who have a well of course you know that you can drill down into that rock and you can find that water. So there's always water down there. Just another schematic to show you this water that's falling on the land as rain or snow. It's going to infiltrate down and it's going to be following different pathways all through the landscapes that, we're, that we live in. So this is how we're starting to look. The hydrologists, the people who study water, this is how they think about water. It's not just that water that's on the surface. So again, we're looking at a cross section through a landscape here where the water's falling on the surface. And you see the light green there, those are those local groundwater places that I was talking about. The water's just going shallow. Then down, way down below is what we call the regional system. That's the water that's going deep down into the system. So we have local water, we have regional water, we have intermediate water, but all of that water is moving down that slope towards our lakes, our rivers, and eventually the ocean. So again, on this schematic, same schematic, this time I just put a red box on here now because this red box here is now represents how we actually think about water on our landscape. So from the science perspective, these are the things we're thinking about and working on here in New Brunswick thinking about how water is on this landscape. As you can see this red box is now covers not only the surface, but it also captures all that material underneath. All of that area we call a response area, a hydrologic response area. It just means the landscape where all the water is connected. So now it's not just a two-dimensional landscape, it's now a three-dimensional landscape. So then we take that area and we start to pull it apart to look at the pieces that make up that waterscape or that water landscape. So we can take the areas that are in the uplands or the valley slopes or the lowland areas and we partition them into the units, into their water units, how that water works in each of those units. And then we put all of those units together to say this is how the water works on the landscape. So up on the right is that same diagram that showed you the three-dimensional space and then our units. And then the units that I'm talking about, we visualize them as these buckets that you see on the left here. So a bucket is just one of those units that comes out of the landscape. And the bucket has a surface, so that's where the water is, some of the water is going to collect. And then the bucket is going to be collect, also have that groundwater collecting and flowing through it. And the buckets can be all kinds of shapes. 
A lake is a bucket. A wetland is a bucket. A hill slope is a bucket. How much soil is on there? How much uh, overburden you have? So all the way down to the depth of bedrock. All of these buckets are going to have a different shape. So now we have buckets. We can put all the buckets together and we can look at how the water is connected by these buckets across these certain types of landscapes. So it's a little hard with uh, this particular diagram. Like I said, I don't want to point the pointer in case I catch the chair. <laughs> but on the top in this box that I have here, what I've done is I put five buckets together. So on the left is a big deep bucket. That's a representative of a forest. And then in the middle, there's three smaller buckets. Those are wetland areas. And then on the right is a larger shallow bucket, which is a lake or a wetland. These buckets, these are these hydrologic units from the science, in the science language. We start to put water into these buckets, so that's the first panel is showing this water starting to accumulate. In the blue, you can see it in the below the buckets is looking at the top of the buckets and how they're connected, how they're filling up with water and how they're connected. And as you start to add more water to the landscape, what happens is the buckets start to fill, and the buckets fill in different ways because they're made of different materials, they're different sizes. And as you add more water to the landscape, the connection amongst all these buckets changes. So this is the model of how water is working on the landscape for those of us who are <clears throat> think about this on a daily basis. We have these whole series of buckets. It's not just one big forest out there. It's not one big agriculture field. It's all of these buckets that are all connected together. So here's an example to show you what I mean by the fact that these buckets are all different, these landscapes are different. This goes back to our Miramichi, so that gray map on the left with the green in it, that's the Miramichi watershed again. And in the red box that I was gonna zoom into, that's actually the Keynes River that has the red circle in, this, in the center panel picture. But in the Miramichi, you have this gray area that you can see there. That's one type of bedrock. And then in the green is another type of bedrock. And the green rock is a very permeable bedrock. It's the kind where there's lots of water inside the rock. And the gray is a not so permeable type of bedrock. There's not much water there. It's very tight, hard to get water out of it. So, when you look at the Keynes River in that circle, in the eclipse that you, or sorry, the ellipse that you see there, I've cut it out down on the bottom right. That's the Keynes River, and it's just a, a view from the headwaters of the Keynes on the left in the brown area down into the green. So it goes from the dark gray down into the green. And that figure that you can see that has a red line going down, that's the water temperature in the Keynes River, and it actually gets colder as you go downstream in the Keynes River. And for those of you who've been in and around rivers, you know that that's not the way it's supposed to work. The headwaters are supposed to be the coldest, and downstream is supposed to be the warmest. But the reason that it's not is because you have to think about it in terms of these different hydrologic units. So in the upstream of the Keynes, you have a different type of rock, Downstream, downstream you have a more permeable rock. So that what happens in the downstream, I'll just zoom into one point in the downstream area of the Keynes River to show you how this works, is on the left you have our, our typical uh, image of the Keynes River. And it's a little bit hard to see there, but there's two wetlands pointed out. One's coming out of a valley to that's flowing down from the top of the image and then one's over in a bogan or a backwater. Those are two, when you just look out at the left, that's the normal image you see, but we have a lot of thermal infrared imagery for our rivers in New Brunswick now. And in that, over on the right is a thermal image with all the trees taken away, so we've put the thermal image on top of just the land itself. And you can see it's all sort of yellowy orange. That's all, temperatures are all the same, including in the river, it's all about the same. Then you can see these very bright blue areas, one coming out of that valley and one in the wetland. That's where the water goes from about 22 degrees down to 16 degrees. And that's why it's colder in those lower reaches, just down here in this lower reaches. 
And it's not because of surface local water, it's because that incised valley that you see there come flowing in from the top, it cuts deep into the bedrock. And that means the water that's coming out that's creating that groundwater that you see there is cold bedrock water. And the reason that I wanted to show you this particular image, <clears throat> because it's going to, trying to emphasize the point that things are complicated when it comes to, uh, in this case, water, but the things we're thinking about on the landscape. So in a case like this, where we're thinking about how do you protect something, how do you protect this kind of environment? Well, a simple buffer zone in this particular case is not working towards protecting this water because this water is coming from deep in the bedrock. It's not coming from what's happening on the land itself. I'm going to, oh, sorry, went a too far. Got ahead of myself here. I was going to show you this diagram uh, to show you just a little bit about how the water and how the trees are responding to the different types of water that are underground. But it's a little hard to see in this particular presentation. I think you have a copy of it in your, in your presentations that you have, your hard copy presentations. But essentially, this diagram is showing you across uh, again, a typical forested landscape. What happens when the permeability of the materials underneath affect how the stress of the trees? So in the top, the top three panels with three different rock formations, the trees are all healthy because it's a, we're not in a drought. But as soon as you get into a drought, because of the different way that the water is flowing through underneath the ground, the trees are going to be in different stresses. And the trees are going to be different types of trees because of that water availability. So again, just to emphasize the fact that things are much more complicated than we think. It's not simply a forest that you see out there. It's a forest out there that's struggling for water as well. OK, so why does all this matter for New Brunswick? Why, why do we care about these details about how water works on the land? As I was saying, we think that the water when you look at the water, you have to start thinking about it in terms of these landscapes of water and the buckets that are on those landscapes and how they're connected because each of these buckets is going to be unique. Some of them are going to be grouped together and so there'll be groups of buckets that are the same, but the buckets are unique and they're all going to behave differently depending on what we do on the land, whether we're harvesting, whether we're planting, whether we're spraying. Each of the buckets is going to be different and how they're connected is going to be different. Some of them are going to be very resilient to what we do. Some of them are going to be very sensitive. Some of them are going to be connected, and some of them are not going to be connected. So what we're working on now is trying to put together a picture of how New Brunswick landscapes work in terms of water so that we can start to say, OK, what about things like things that we talk about a lot, like buffer zones? Are buffer zones the one, will one size fit all? And the answer is no, a buffer zone, that's not how buffer zones are going to work in terms of protecting for the water. What about cut block size? We talked about, you were talking about it before. Again, it depends from a hydrologic, hydrological perspective, from a water perspective, it depends on the landscape you're talking about. And so that gets you to one of the principal questions that you're asking, and that's about chemical treatments on the landscape. The same goes for these chemical treatments. How they get applied to the landscape depends on what the landscape looks like. How are all these buckets connected? How is the landscape connected? So it's back to my, my original point about what, I guess, the take-home message for you is, is that these things are actually quite complicated. The way we're managing it the, in currently is we're thinking backwards, looking at our back, backwards towards the watershed, for example, the map that I showed you way back in the beginning and how we manage it. In fact, it's much, uh, as I tried to show you, it's, it's a three-dimensional picture. There's much more to it than just that water on the landscape. It's, and so that's the take-home message for you, is that no matter what treatment we want to use on the landscape, chemical treatment, physical treatment, however we're going to change that, the location, the application, these things all matter, and they matter very importantly. So we have to start thinking about things, starting to think, stop thinking about things from the way we did it in the past to how we need to do it in the future. And that's where I'll leave it with you.
Thank you, uh, Professor Curry. That was insightful. As a Miramichir, I was enjoying those maps. I'm, I'm still torn between the Keynes River, Bartholomew River, and Dungarvan. I love all three equally, and I can't seem to decide which is my favorite. But as a kid, it was Bartholomew. Before we head to the questions, I want to let you know as well that in September, this committee will meet again, and the focus will be on water quality, and in particular, upland rivers and streams. So I'm sure, I'm sure you could come back maybe at that time and give another presentation again. So for now, we're going to turn over to the official opposition. And who's, uh, was it Madame Landry? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a very different way to look at the landscape of New Brunswick uh, by its hydrology or, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a different way of looking at it, and I do think that uh, we have to take care of uh, that uh, landscape as well. What do you see with climate change in mind? Uh, what has changed uh, as far as that landscape and what will in the future? Already, I mean, mm. from now on. Yeah, so uh, we've looked at We've been looking at the past records for a while to look at how surface waters have been responding. So we know in the Miramichi, for example, we have records back to the 1900s, early 1900s, and uh, we've been tracking those changes because one of the things that we've been interested in terms of climate change is what the impacts will be on the fish that are in the river there, because most of our fish in those rivers are cold water species. They need colder water. Uh, and one of the interesting findings that's coming out from that is that back in the early 1900s, as soon as we started taking records, the waters were just as low and probably just as warm as they are today. So while things are changing on a global scale, locally some of the changes in some of our rivers uh, are staying pretty, changes aren't there, they're just staying at a normal rate. As I was trying to show before, though, is that some of our areas are more sensitive to others. Mm. And some, so what we have to do now is try to figure out where are those sensitive areas in terms of how the climate's going to impact our rivers and lakes and our groundwater resources. And that's what one of the things that we're working on now is that where, is, where are things resilient, where are they not so resilient? So have you come up with some solutions or you're still your team or your group are still uh, working on it uh, where are you at at this time so we are working on it it's one of the it's pride we we're just started into some some bigger major research looking at temperature over time okay and uh, the response of the animals in the river to that temperature over time so we're I would say you know we're at the point of saying we know that there are some issues but we don't know where the issues are yet. Okay, and uh, with the use of the forest and how we uh, use it, uh, let's say uh, clear cutting and uh, uh, having more forest plantations, I I'm sure the, re the answer is probably yes, but what do you foresee in the future as far as impact on the um, hydrological systems and areas of New Brunswick? So it's another project that we've just started to look at uh, how, how, our, how we're managing the land and how the water is responding to those different management uh, actions. So whether we're clear cutting or select cutting or it's plantation. So we've just started a new project to try to look at that hydrology. So we, you know, we're thinking we're three or four years from having an answer. Okay. But what we did promise uh, the department of uh, natural resources, energy and resources, is that we would have some maps of uh, resilient, some bit, the first level, our first, our first crack at the maps of where the landscape is resilient and where it is not, so that they can start to incorporate it into their next set of forest, okay. forest management planning. Okay. It's a little bit, you know, as a scientist, which I usually get labeled as, you know, I don't want to say that we need to study more stuff and we have to keep studying all the time. We have some ideas now about how it works and what we'd like to see is uh, that actually getting incorporated into the management right now. And we'll improve it as we go along, but you know, we've got some answers now. Okay, and, and will that be only applied to forestry management or can it also, it, it will also affect uh, agricultural land and, uh, 
even urban land and uh, development around cities or towns or whatever? Yes, that's so. We've we've taken uh, for the from the forest management. The forest managers have asked for this, so we've, we're oh. giving it to them. But we're actually building it for the entire province. So we have the entire province uh, mapped out. We have all of the information on the depth to bedrock and basic hydrology for all of this. It's, we're doing it for the whole province, including things you were asking about climate change, uh, some flood modeling as well to see what's going to happen as we add more water, okay. when we add more water, what's going to happen on that landscape. Okay, and do you as well analyze or take it into account the quality of the water? Not in our research group. Okay. But there are others who are doing it, including uh, Department of Environment. They have their standard sets of data that they should be collecting. Okay, because, you know, the quality of the water that uh, we're drinking is obviously a also important and uh, if it's uh, the toxicity of the uh, chemicals that are being applied to some areas you know it affect if it affects the water the watersheds and stuff like that you'll probably be working with that group eventually mm -hmm. so the way the water you know, the way that we look at the water, the water is the transport mechanism. So if the water is if the water is moving fast, then when you have contamination occurring, that contamination might not all whatever that contamination. I say contamination, whatever is in yes. the water is going to move faster. But in the places where the water is held up and it's moving slow, those would be the areas where you might have a concern about some accumulation of chemicals, for for example, in the water. Okay, thank you. Those are the questions I have. I don't know if you have some. Thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, very interesting uh, information this afternoon. Appreciate your appreciate your presentation. I have a couple questions about talk about buckets of water. <clears throat> What's the? Do you guys study anything about the sea level rise? along the coastal lines of New Brunswick and uh, the effects on the erosion and the effects of possible, you know, the, the inland? Uh, so not specifically in our group, but there are other groups at the university who are studying that. Okay, thank you. We talked about the floods, St. John River. Um, what kind of research, what kind of information can you d give us about possible problematics that you might have looked at on the St. John River with floods. Uh, you know, is there something you can tell us? I can tell you that, so we've looked at, uh, we've been looking at remote sense data. So you heard something from your previous speaker about these satellite images that we have. And some of these satellite images that we have now are able to tell us a lot about water on the landscape over time so we can track that water over time. So we're actually looking in the St. John River, we've been looking at how much water accumulates in the year prior to, prior to the flood. So we have our floods in the spring, how much water is accumulating on the landscape in the entire year before that, because that we think is connected to how much water is available in the spring and then how it's released and put into the river. In terms of what's happening on the land in the St. John River, uh, we've looked at how much land is um, how much land is not in forest in that area, and it's a pretty small amount that's actually not in the forest itself. So, okay. those are things that we're starting to look at now. What kind of recommendation could you give give to the committee? I know you talked about um, possibility of deforestation. There's chemi chemical treatments on on on. Um, <clears throat> On, the, on either agriculture or on the, on the civic culture. Did you guys look at the, the possibilities that that has a, a, a negative impact uh, on the, um, the water, the, uh, the temperature of the water in the rivers? Uh, could it have a, a, a very serious impact, a short term, medium term, and long term? So those are, those are some of the questions that we're really taking a deep dive into at the moment. And I can tell you that the research that we've done in the past and others have done have shown that uh, we'll take forestry as an example. Bad forestry done wrong is very bad for the water, whether it's wetlands, rivers, lakes. 
uh, good forestry done properly and thinking about water, thinking about the water landscape, it usually has a lower impact on those, those systems. So that's where we're trying to, that's kind of thing that we're doing here is we're trying to get everyone to think about water, take a deeper dive into water so that they're thinking about it. So when they do, when we do have um, management plans going forward in the future, they actually say, okay, is that buffer zone in that place the right buffer zone for that type of system? Okay. Thank you. That's all my time. Thank so, you. Uh, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, and good afternoon. It's good to see you, Dr. Curry. Um, so maybe I can get you to flesh out a little bit uh, how practically speaking or operationally speaking, say, uh, if we're thinking of forest management that thinks about the water landscape, what, what does that actually mean? Does it mean uh, changing the management units to represent hydrological response areas that you explained or hydrological units or watersheds or... Uh, I have no idea what, operationally speaking, what, what gets, gets the forest managers into the water landscape um, sort of lens? It's uh, a good question because that's exactly what we want to do for them is we, we basically want to create a GIS tool for them. So when they're doing their forest management planning, they have a layer in that forest management planning that says this is the resiliency of your, your water landscape. This plate, all of these units here are very sensitive, so that means that they need a different management op activity than over here where they're not, where they are sensitive. So protect the, you're gonna have to have extra protection in these units, <clears throat> maybe less protection, not less protection, but a different set of protection over in these other units. So that's where we're trying to get to in terms of operationalizing. Okay, um, so can, can you just, um you ran through it, but just a little more slowly, the, the, the variables that determine sensitivity. So what sort of variables lead to greater or lesser sensitivity? So in terms of sensitivity, there are uh, two things that affect the sensitivity in terms of water, and one is going to be how much overburden you have. So from the top of the, top of the land where you're standing down to the bedrock. So if you have a deep, overburden so you have lots of loose material on the on this on the surface of the earth that means that more water can be held in that surface and it's easy it's quickly available to the land so that's one of the elements and then down deeper when you get to the bedrock some bedrock is very permeable and it has water in it like our sedimentary rocks that we have down in the Miramichi lowland is you know if you go over to PEI you get out towards PEI <clears throat> Those rocks hold a lot of water, and then you have rocks that don't have hold, hold water. So those, that combination of how much overburden you have and then what kind of rocks are underneath it, that will dictate how sensitive that landscape is going to be. Sorry, and the third thing will be the surface itself. So what's the topography? What's the hill? Are there a lot of hills or no hills? Those things are going to affect it. So in terms of... Um so the more sensitive areas would have less overburden, have bedrock that wasn't very permeable, and would have more complicated topography? Would that be right? Yep, that's exactly it. And when I say we're going to provide a first level measure of sensitivity to the water landscape, that's exactly the kind of thing that we're mapping out now. Well, that's going to be very valuable. What's the time frame on that? Are we talking years or, or months? Uh, well, we promised we'd have it done by March, the first level map done by March. Oh, that's great. For, this is for the department? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so, and, and this, okay, and this, this, this approach then would help uh, adjust, uh, adjust management to deal with what you were talking about, that, that uh, when you think of water one size, doesn't fit all, that that approach doesn't address the variability and sensitivity of, of water. And so this approach would, would help provide guidance to forest managers to uh, adjust things like buffers that, that make sense based on the sensitivity of the, the water in the area? Exactly. The buffer, the cut block, the practices that you use, what the sprays that you, when you might use a spray, when you might not use chemical, 
spray a chemical treatment and it's beyond like we're doing this specifically for the forest management group but it's for the whole, we're doing it for the whole of the province so it's for whatever land use we may want to use whether it's farming whether it's mining whether it's road building all of all of these will have that that layer will be built into the provincial uh, database, I guess. Has, has your group, uh, institute, has anyone within the institute done research on um, glyphosate uh, in water? Um, our previous speaker, Dr. Betts, I'm sure you know of, a graduate of UMB, um, he talked about the, the, the lack of long-term studies uh, dealing with with or different organisms in, in, in nature um, because the costs involved in, <laughs> in doing that well, uh, both in terms of the length of time you've got to do it and the, and the people power sometimes to carry out the work. Um, so so what, what has the Institute been able to do with respect to looking at glyphosate in, in water? I mean, there's some literature on it for sure, but what about here? So we currently have one project uh, that's up in the Tobique area that's looking at salmon embryo development in relationship to potential glyphosate in the surface waters. So we have that project underway. There is a spruce bud worm project that a uh, few of us are involved in. Uh, that's a Quebec, New Brunswick initiative that's ongoing <clears throat> that's looking at, not at glyphosate, but looking at, um, again, chemical treatments on the landscape, but they're all in terms of you know, these, any treatment that you're going to put on the land. It's, we don't have the studies going on here in New Brunswick, uh, and maybe we should have some more studies going on in New Brunswick if we're gonna continue to be using that treatment. But there's a good, there's good literature on what the effects of glyphosate have been on everything that from birds, from from the insects to birds to the aquatic environments, what's going on. So we have, a, we have an idea about what's going on. But I'll come back to my main point, what I was trying to tell you, trying to get across to you, is that it's much more complicated than what we know. That's the research from what we knew in the past and what, how we thought about how these chemicals work. The research that's emerging on these agrochemicals, forest chemicals, glyphosate, as an example, it's much more complicated than we were thinking, and the effects turn out to be not the direct effects like causing cancer or causing death. They turn out to be things like working on the microbiome of an, of an insect's gut, and that can have an impact on the survivability of that insect. So it's very, these are the things that are emerging. So again, it's going back, we think about, we've used glyphosate for a long time, we know that it, lots of research have shown that you can't show it in the water, you can't show that it's having a direct impact. But as we delve deeper into understanding, we realize that it's actually much more complicated and the effects are happening at different levels than we were looking at before. And it's happening at those different levels. That has a cumulative effect up through the system. So again, it's just this idea of that, you know, I don't want to be the scientist saying we have to keep doing studies over and over again, but the reality is, is we're learning more and more every time about these things. So the message is it is complicated. So when you, so in the literature I see things like uh, with respect to aquatic environments, glyphosate is, is a problem for Daphnia. Um, and so that doesn't tell us much as what you're, what you're, what you're telling me, I think. That's right. The fact that it's, it's got some toxicity for Daphne in aquatic environments doesn't, it's, too, it's more complicated than, than that, right? Yeah, it, it turns out that, you know, this, as we learn more and more about our environment and what we do with, when we change our environment, we add chemicals, synthetic chemicals to the environment, we know that there are things happening that we didn't think about in the past. So we now know that there's studies coming out DDT, for example, on DDT, for example, that are showing that it's multi-generational. It's intergenerational changes of this exposure to these chemicals that we didn't realize before. The effects aren't happening in the people who were exposed. It's two generations away where the effects are happening. And so that's what I'm saying here in terms of 
when we put these chemicals on the landscape, we don't really understand yet what it, what's going on, even though we have lots of great studies and lots of great people have invested a lot of time in trying to understand it. We know what we know today, but that's probably not the rest of the story. This should be encouraging for any student who's thinking about a career in science. There's endless work, it sounds like, and important work that could make a difference. Uh, that's great. So um, one, one quick question, if I may. Um, also in the literature, there's some, some uh, work that's looked at the impacts of glyphosate in water on driving um, increases in the production of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, maybe people will know by. Um, I don't know how much of that there's out there in terms of research. Uh, are, are you familiar with the literature at all on that, and can you speak to it? It's true. It's some of the again some of the emerging things that are coming out of out of uh, you know, today's I guess some of the recent research that's happening is that as glyphosate is broken down in the environment, it actually produces phosphorus, and phosphorus is the chemical is the sorry the nutrient for increasing plant growth in aquatic systems, and plant growth in aquatic systems starts with algae. So we know that if you have, you know, like life it's going to break down to the phosphorus, and we think there is some potential link to increase in algae. Again, it's, it's not that simple because uh, glyphosate can be bound up and held, held in the soil and not available, so there's, it, it's complicated. Right. As someone once said to me, ecology is more complicated than rocket science, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, Ms. Conroy, your time begins now. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for being here today. Um, just a little to add with Mr. Kuhn, you talked about forestry research, uh, and they are doing research. My question was about, you know, if they were doing it. So um, I guess just um, who's leading the research, and, and when will this, these results become available? So the hydrology part of it is that's work that's being done by my team. So I'm the lead on that, and uh, we're in a we're in a three-year project time frame at the moment. And I said our first our first product going back to Natural Resources Group, the Energy and Resources Group, will be this year. So by Mar this by March of next year. So. And is the big industry or Irving a part of this? Um the research and, and on the, I guess, tour with your team in this? Yep, so um, we have been working with the Irving Group for a while and we've, what we've done with them is we've got, uh, we've got their plans, so we know what they're planning on doing in terms of harvesting. So what we're doing at the moment is trying to place our research sites within those areas where we know the land's not going to change, or the land's going to change soon, or it's going to change farther down the road, or it's coming back in regrowth. So we're looking for sites right now with, with them to find those sites to use. Okay, that's all right. Um, there's currently a research project at UNB that are looking into the deer uh, and changes to the deer across New Brunswick and across the landscape. Um, this research is occurring, you know, 10 to 20 years after after the year, deer yards became vacant. So how, how well would this, uh, this study be able to determine the cause of the current low numbers of the, with the deer on the crown land? So uh, I'm just trying to think about how to, how to give you the best answer to that because obviously there's not a direct link between what's happening, what we're doing in terms of water on the landscape and the deer. But the longer term connect is that how, we're, how the forest is changing and that's how the forest is changing is impacting wildlife, deer being one example. And so uh, how we're going to manage that landscape going forward, we can only give, our group can only give one layer into that decision making and that's the water layer. The other layers that have to go in there are the biodiversity layers, the habitat for individual key species layers. So we can just provide one layer into that entire management process. There's been a lot of debate on what affects the long-term decline in the deer numbers. Um, some biologists suggest coyotes, wildlife, 
Uh, others suggest that it would be more related to habitat. When we've seen the large deer increase um, in the northeast, it was all, all the um, biologists had suggested that it was a habitat that caused the increase. So is it absurd, absurd to, that some biologists suggest that the loss of browse over 13,000 acres a year um, you know, would, cause, um, would not cause a decline over the, the number of deer? I sorry, I can't really, I can't really answer that because I don't really know what's going on with the deer population, and I'm not connected to the folks over in. They're in my group. They're in my department, but I'm not working with them. Sorry, I can't give you that answer. Okay, but I'll save them for another group as well. Uh, what do you think is most neg negatively impacting the cold water streams in New Brunswick? So the, that is something that we're trying to, trying to work on now. So the cold water that you see, as I tried to show in my presentation, comes from a lot of different sources. There's a, it can be shallow water that's cold, or it can be deep groundwater that's making cold, the cold water environments. Whether or not we're losing cold water or not losing cold water, that part we haven't quite figured out yet. So we know that people are obviously concerned about it, and we're we're concerned about it because we it's in the news a lot, and it's 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 clearly evident that the climate around us is changing, and it's getting warmer, and we're we can see warm waters, warm surface waters, and the fact for us as we look at our landscape, we look at it over the last hundred years. That we don't know for sure whether there's been a reduction in the cold water, the total cold water availability or not. Maybe we'll be able to get that get to that over over time. But it, you know, in the last hundred years, we're not sure that there's been a change in the total cold water availability in the province. Okay. And lastly, if you could change one thing in the forest to best help the streams and the fish, what would, what would you suggest? What would your suggestion be? <laughs> uh, I guess the suggestion would be, uh, what I'm alluding to here is that <clears throat> we need to sit down and think a little bit more about what we do on our land. We need to think a little bit more about how all of the things are connected. I've given you the example of how water is connected. You've asked about deer, so how are the wildlife, the water, the trees, everything connected? Because it's all connected. You can't simply look at a forest anymore and say, this is their forest and we're gonna go out and harvest it. It's not, it's, this is a forest that sits and it's connected to this land over here, it's this landscape over here. Everything is connected and that's, that's the message that I try to get to everyone, every, everyone when I'm talking about <clears throat> uh, whatever, issue it may be is if everything is connected. We need to start thinking about things as being very connected. I remember when we were in school, I think that was the, the biggest thing I remember our science teacher always saying that if you change one thing in our system, it changes everything else around it. And uh, that always seemed to stick with me then. So I guess that applies here too. So I thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation, your answers, and thank you, Mr. Co-Chair as well. Thank you, Ms. Conroy. Uh, we will now move over to the government side. Uh, Ms. Bacchus. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, and thank you for coming here today. It's been most interesting. I just wondered, I just have a couple of questions. Is there an accumulative effect of the components that, are, that end up in the groundwater, and do they get filtered out and then remain in the soil for years? You said some of the strata was there for centuries and millennia and whatever. Like, are you concerned about the accumulation of things that might filter down through? Yeah, that's a very good question because that's exactly what happens is there is a cumulative effect of the things that we do in, in terms of water, the things that we're doing on the surface, anything that we're putting into the water has the potential to be accumulated over time and be deep in the water. And there's lots of studies done in areas where there's been direct contamination, where it's it's years later and deep in the bedrock where we're actually finding these contaminants are there now. This is what you're seeing as well in terms of coming back to the connectivity and the connections amongst all of these things where you see in the Arctic where 
DDT levels are very high in Arctic mammals and fish. They're high because we put them in the atmosphere for many years and they've accumulated. They're out in the atmosphere and they're moving around and they're connected. So what we've done down here on, in North America, Central North America, is contaminating things that are in the Arctic because it's all connected. So that accumulation of materials that we're putting out there, that's, that's in fact true. It will be true also that they're not, doesn't mean that they're just, everything's accumulating and it's available and it's going to, uh, going to be available at some time in the future. It may be available, but it may also be stored away and it may be there and it might be there for millennia. So that's true as well. And that's a scary thought, that it's going to be there for millennia. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you very much. I, uh, just one more, I was going to tell you that yeah. as well, we looked at not, not my group, but another group looked at uh, DDT, DDT in the lake beds of New Brunswick, and the DDT that has been sprayed now since the 60s mm. is there in the lake beds. So it's, a, it's there. It's all locked up in the lake beds, but it is there. So even though the chemicals or, or pesticides, whatever, may filter out of the water, it doesn't mean they're gone forever. They're still in the soil or deep in the lake beds or somewhere. Depending, so depending on the type of chemical that it is, if the bacteria can break it down and break it down into its byproducts, then that's a good thing. But if it's just sitting there and locked away, sometimes it gets just locked by the soil itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, so to follow up with that one, so we got DDT that we're finding that's in the water uh, systems. Are we seeing any forestry herbicides as well? With the 40, 50, whatever year history that we've got, does that give us any kind of a sample of that? Uh, I didn't see anything from that group in terms of other chemicals they were finding. We know, we do see that in our we see other chemicals in those substrates, like mercury, yeah. cadmium, and they're coming from some of them are coming from somewhere. Some of them are natural, but so those things are accumulating. The herbicide, did you say herbicide? Yeah. The herbicides tend the, that we're using at the moment tend to be, they tend to have a short, um, a short availability in terms of being in the surface water before they're either taken up by bacteria break them down or they get absorbed on the soil so okay. we don't tend to see those things in the water even after a day or two if you wanted to, okay. if that's what you're asking. No, fair enough. You had indicated that the records from over 100 years indicate that if I heard you correctly that the Miramichi River system is just as low and just as warm today as it was back then. Is that consistent throughout the province as you see river systems? Uh, so we don't know for sure whether it's consistent throughout the province. We have data for the mirror machine. Where we have data from. So we, okay. we do know that. We know that when we go back, so if you go back and look at the <laughs> reports that were written by Ganong back at the turn of the last century, and the pictures that are there, they're the same as today. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, we hear lots of conversation around flooding, and it's been a significant issue over the last years of late. And then we we here, I mean, us on the committee and uh, just general population talk a lot about how the clear cutting has created floods. Is there a correlation that you know of between uh, the clear cutting and particularly the flooding in the St. John River system that we have? Um, there's none that I'm aware of. There have definitely been studies that have looked at clear cutting and its impact on hydrology, so on how much water gets to the stream. And as I said, right at, at some point in the talk, bad forestry practices lead to bad results when it comes to water on the landscape, flooding and those kinds of things. Uh, but that means you've got to do it really bad. You've got to really take, you've got to really hit it hard, the landscape hard in order to Define that, that, yeah. Walk that out. Define what that bad forestry practice would be. So clear cutting, uh, large areas of clear cuts would be in general perceived to be bad for, from a water perspective because that means there would be a lot more water available on the land itself. It wouldn't be taken up by the trees. The trees, when the rain falls, the trees take up that water, the roots take up that water. 
But if you take all of that away, then when the water comes to the landscape, onto the land, then there is propensity for that water to stay near the surface and move down and create more water in the stream. So that's the basis of how the flooding would work. But you would have to have uh, very significant areas in a clear cut within, a, within a, a catchment, like I was showing you, for that to be actually having an effect. And in the St. John River, we have looked at how much land is being, how much land is in forest and not. In the St. John River, there's not a lot of land that's um, in forest operations, in clear cuts. I think there's as much land in potato farming as sure. there is in clear cuts in the St. John. So it would be extremely difficult to make that link in the St. John River. Would, okay, farmers fields right up to the end of a riverbank though, mm -hmm. that that's very similar. Is that similar? Like if, uh, if the farmer's field was big enough and there weren't adequate buffers? Uh, well, that... farmer's, farmer's fields, if the farmer's field doesn't have its a buffer zone at the end of the field, it's probably in a worse situation because all, as far as I know, all forest lands in New Brunswick, any stream in a forest land has to have a buffer. So there's at yeah. least some protection there. I thought that farmlands did too. I don't know for sure. I know in PEI they do. So. Yeah. But that's in a forest, the difference between the forested lands, an operational forest landscape that's in a clear cut and a, and a farm, a, a potato farm for example, is that in the farm land it's cultivated and that land is not as stable in terms of holding the water as it would be in the forested land where there's still roots and there's stumps yeah. and there's stuff. It's, it's going to be able to hold that water. Would you be able to draw a correlation between the uh, a particular forested area? W would you would there be a prescription to say, okay, here's a here's a clear cut. It is going to based on the hydrology, the bedrock, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to require X amount of a buffer, and then if that amount of a buffer was there, it would then ensure that we wouldn't see runoffs or we wouldn't see issues is there, a, is there a formula that can be put together on that that's the formula that we're working on right now <clears throat> okay. we hope to have that formula within within the year we'll have the first cut at that formula for and in addition to that buffer zone from what i'm hearing from this presentation what what i found interesting was from the ground down as much as what's going on in the ground up can be affecting how all of that your your your, your rock formations and whatnot as well so yeah the buffer zone a buffer zone one size does not fit all. You cannot just simply yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, put a 100 meter buffer strip on every river in the province. You could, and that would be a nice thing, and there's reasons why you have a buffer zone. It's a good wildlife corridor. Sure. It provides lots of other, but it's not, it, from a water perspective, that's, that's not the answer. The one there's, size there's fits all. There's a whole bunch of pulleys and levers that you gotta have a look at and say, in this particular stretch, mm -hmm. it should have a buffer of X amount. That's right. Okay. That's interesting. Well, that's everything I had. Uh, go ahead. Yep. Minister Crosman. 30 seconds. Smallmouth bass, Mammoth Sheet Lake. What do you do? <laughs> which, so I've only got 19 seconds. Which story do you want? From, yeah. the, from, from the day that we found out about it, when Mark... Hambrook and I stood on the river as when we were told about it, or do you want to know? Today. <laughs> uh, so you're in a situation where you have, you should have acted a long time ago. <clears throat> should you go ahead and do what you're probably going to do? Uh, I, I guess my, it comes back to my opinion that things are very complicated and putting chemicals in a river, in a lake, while it seems like we understand it and we might have an environmental impact assessment that makes sure that we do it right, I think we're going to find out it's much more complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Curry. Um, we do appreciate you being here today. And that was, uh, Minister, that was pretty good, sneaking that one in at the last minute. I liked it. But uh, like I say, we appreciate it. I'll give you a, just a minute or so to say goodbye and uh, just know that we appreciate your being here today and it was insightful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the committee and uh, thanks for doing the great work that you're doing.
hopefully we'll see some good results coming out of your committee. Thank you, sir.